afternoon, Jack. Good afternoon. Well, I, mean, I remember these places. Used to have squatters in before they were evicted. Got those bucket and seat privies down the bottom of the garden. Bum freezers, we used to call them. Yeah. Right, where we going? How we got? Anyway, enough of the history lesson. So, tell me what you've got. A body, I understand. Yeah, it was a duffer by the looks of it. Yeah. Wasn't stuck in the privies, was he? Oh, about as bad. In a coal bunker, right to your left. Right. Yeah. Well, he's dead, all right. Any idea who it might have been? Yeah, it's probably some tramp who crept in, got hypothermia. Yeah, it's been there months by the looks of it, at least. Was he like this when he was found? No, no, it was covered up. The corrugated iron was across the top. Sergeant Maud, Denton CID. You took your time. Did you keep the beggar up? I'm the GP. This is Lily, Lily Turner. She's in a very distressed state. I'd rather you didn't touch anything. Who are you, by the way? I live next door. George Armitage. Her husband's inside, 18 months, stealing radios from cars. He stole mine. Hello, Lily. Do you want to tell me what happened? Did someone hurt your baby? <laughs> Seems someone broke in and woke the child. Lily was watching TV in the next room. She tried to get in here but couldn't. He switched a chair under the door handle. She isn't moving around, so she comes running next door to me. I come round and kick the door open. He'd gone. How is the child? Is there any sexual interference? No evidence of that. No, the child's untouched. There's no evidence of anything. Oh, except I found this hypodermic on the floor. Any idea what's in it? Not sure. Clear water? As far as I can tell. I'd like to see Mr. Frost. I think he's got my medals. Jack? Yeah? Young lady to see you. <sighs> Sorry, me again. I wondered if you'd got them back. Got them back, Mrs. Um, Hinkley. Hinkley. They're the medals, you remember. A man came from the water and stole them. Came from the water, did he? Not so much the jewellery, it's my husband's medals. He was shot down over Hamburg in the war. Posthumous DFM. Con artist came to your door claiming it was from the water board, is that right? Popped upstairs to flush the loo. When he'd left, he'd taken everything. Yes, listen, love. If I get any news, I'll be in touch right away, I promise. I knew you would, Mr. Frost, being a hero yourself. Worst things happen at sea. Come on, what is it? All right, let me guess. Mr. Mullet has not come through with your promotion to acting DI. No, and he's good as promised. Well, he couldn't swing it, love, could he? Not now GCI Peters has come back. All right, so what's he got you working on? It's a strange case. We had another incident last night that's four in two weeks. It's a child abuser. Sexual interference? No. That's what makes it strange. He breaks into houses where there are young children. He seems not to do anything. Except last night we found a hypodermic syringe. Know any mad doctors? Was there water in the hypodermic? Yeah. He's not a doctor. He just thinks he ought to be. You know who it is, sir? Well, I sniff something. You won't find it on your database, either. You better see me in the morning. It's time you met our Mr. Trigg, who's in charge of card indexing. As quick as you can. Ah, there you are, Inspector. Come in. Have a look. Fine. Nothing much to show, I suppose, is it? That's where you're wrong. 
What do you want to know? Well, usual things. Was he murdered? Very much so. He died of a heavy blow to the head which smashed his skull. I doubt if he died of the bunker, probably killed elsewhere and moved soon after. Mm. Interested in food? Well, no, not at the moment. Pity, because we managed to salvage his stomach contents. Oh, my goodness. Substantial meal. He probably died within an hour of eating it. Salmon, fish cake, peas and chips washed down with an artificially flavoured carbonated liquid. A what? A fizzy drink. Mm. Nothing on the body to identify him. He was wearing an ordinary waterboard jacket over ordinary clothes. Pockets all empty. He was a big man. Not much chance of any fingerprints, I suppose. Well, we might get something. There are interesting scraps of flesh and his DNA. And we're working on it, Inspector. Hmm. Do you know what the funny thing is? I think I know him. Shop. Yeah. Ah. Morning, Tree. How are you? All right. Yeah, well, Jack. I'm all right. Listen, I want you to find... Here, aren't these all supposed to be in alphabetical order? Wasn't that what it was invented for? Oh, very funny. Mm -hmm. Everything got mixed up when we moved, didn't it? Yeah. Now they're saying these files are redundant. Now, that's what we'll all be soon. Bloody computers. You know they've got no heart, have they? No feeling for personal information. No instinct. No, I know what you mean. Anyway, listen, and I want your help. Have you got anything on an unlikely lad called Sidney Snell? Slimy Sid. He used to call her houses saying it was from the health department and the kids needed to be vaccinated. Yeah, that's the one. <sighs> Sidney was a troubled little boy of 30, Sergeant. Bright lad in his way. His uncle used to be a GP and left him his medical bag. And for some unknown reason, he used to like to stick needles into plump little bottoms or fat little arms. Yeah. Did it eight or nine times before we caught him. He served three years. They promised him psychiatric help. Why is he not computer listed? Because this was all of, what, eight years ago? Uh, no, it was about seven. Anyway, he left Denton. Too many parents threatened to do him over if he ever came back. So when he left prison, he went up north somewhere. So why tell me to look for him then? Because Sidney's only friend was his mother. And I thought that he might come back to live with Mummy now that it's all been forgotten. Mm. He'll be in here somewhere. Under unusual interests. <laughs> yes. There you are, Jack. Hmm? That's him, Sidney Snell, 44 Parnell Terrace. Well, that's his mother's address, anyway. Well, do you want to go and have a look, Sergeant? Mm. Sidney's always been a mummy's boy. They reckon he's never had sex, so he's never grown up, you know, in that way. Mm. It's called sublimation, sir. Yeah, well, whatever. He likes to play doctors and nurses. Especially if there's a childhood epidemic about, he thinks that he's saving them. Ah, oh, Jack. Ah, oh, yes. Body in the coal bunker. Yeah? We've come up with an ident. You'll never believe it. Go on. Lemmy Hoxton. Lemmy Hoxton. God. I've nicked Lemmy Hoxton, which is bastard. <laughs> We've all nicked Lemmy Hoxton. Oh, yeah. What's his wife's name? Uh, Maggie. Maggie. What has she been doing then? I mean, he's been dead for three months and she's not even reported him missing. Well, she probably couldn't believe her luck. Oh, you're <laughs> right. Anyway, she's got some questions to answer. Come on, let's go. Shall I chase up Sydney Snow herself then, sir? Uh, no, you can study that file for now. Toyota. Hello, Maggie. Mr. Frost, will this be business? Our pleasure. Hmm. If you're looking for Lemmy, he's not here. I know that. He's dead. Who says? I did. But you knew that, didn't you? No, I didn't. When Lemmy died, he bequeathed me a murder to investigate. So, can we come in and have a look round? If you... Searching me house, you've no right. Don't you want to know what happened to him? 
No. Good, I'll tell you. He's been dead for three months. Someone hit him on the head. Oh, dear. So you're bearing up well to the recent news of your tragic loss? Lemmy was a vicious sod, alive or dead. I'm glad. In fact, I'm over the moon. Yeah. Well, when did you see him last? Three months ago. We had a Barney and he walked out. Well, don't you find that strange? That he just left his house, left his Toyota, left his change of underwear? What was this row about? Theological matters, was it? Bumping matters. He was umping another woman. Oh, Jack. Yes. Just found these. In the back bedroom. Well, don't look at me. They'll be lemmies. Well, more of his ill-gotten gains, eh? Anything else? Yeah. His checkbook in the dressing table. Lemmy left you three months ago. Did he leave you plenty for housekeeping? No, he didn't give a sod about me. Oh, come on, Maggie. You know that's not true. He cared about you. Of course he did. Even when he was dead, he went on signing checks for you. You see this? This is his checkbook. We talked to the bank. Lemmy died three months ago. Yet he signed one of these last week. OK. I did his signature. I was alone and I was broke. The jury's not going to convict me on that, are they? Now, come on, Maggie. You wouldn't have done that if he'd still been alive, because he would have given you a bloody good hiding. Do you know what I reckon? I reckon that you and one of your boyfriends hit him on the head with something heavy. Oh, you got to be joking. Give us a fag. I'll tell you the truth. Lemmy went out to do a job that day. One of his usual house calls, was it? When he didn't come back, I thought he'd been nicked. It happened so often. Then he didn't come back, and he didn't come back again. Well, you don't look a gift horse in the mouth, do you? After a bit, I started doing his checks. Didn't you think he might be dead? I hoped so. Why didn't you call the police? Because if I had, his real wife might have got his house and his cash flow. I'm his common law. Give us me bag. His credit card statement. Lemmy never let that card out of his sight. If he pegged out three months ago, how come he spent 700 quid at a Supertech discount warehouse a fortnight ago? You're detectives, you work it out. Because I reckon whoever killed him might have taken his wallet as well, don't you? Look at that there, look. Gas off, water off. The only thing that's missing is sod off. You know, this used to be a nice street once before they started knocking it to pieces. <laughs> anyway, that's where Sydney Snell used to live. There, look, number 44. I came here about uh, seven years ago to arrest him. I remember. His mother answered the door. Sydney was in the kitchen. He got a tea towel round his shoulders. She'd been cutting his hair. Locks all over the floor. When I told him the charges, his mother just said, Oh dear, Sydney, I thought you'd always been a good boy. And she clobbered him beside the ear off. Outside, the neighbours were gathering. Shouting abuse and throwing things at the car when we left. Sydney didn't understand what was going on. He didn't think he'd done anything wrong. He loved kids, he said. He just... just wanted to help them. He got four years. He... What was that? There's someone in there. All right, come on. Up now. Who is it? It's the Avon lady. 
Come on, Sydney, I want to work with you. Thought it was you, Mr. Frost. Hope to never see you again. Yeah, I bet you did. Well, come on, there's your mother. Your mother died. She was in hospital for weeks. They only told me when she was dying. She went before I got there. Very sorry to hear that, Sydney. I'd still like to come in and have a talk with you. Come in. No, thank you. I expect you'll say what this is about. Well, we were just passing and I thought I know where to get a nice cup of tea and a fancy cake. When did your mother die, Mr. Snell? Two weeks ago. So you've been in Denton two weeks? You staying here? Oh, I can't, can I? They're pulling this down. Mother was the last tenant. She told them she'd never go while she was still alive. So when she died, before the funeral, they told me they were going to knock our house down. Tomorrow, everything gets cut off. I'm going back to Newcastle. Mr Snell, about the time you came to Denton, we started getting complaints of children being interfered with in their cots. I, I, I never hurt children. It was ages ago. I was caught and punished. I learned my lesson. They don't like child molesters in prison. No, I know. I'm not too keen on them either. I got beaten up. Yeah. Where were you the night before last, Mr. Snow? Here. I never go out. Let's see. What do you do to amuse yourself in Sydney, eh? I read the Bible. I've taken my punishment. Turn to the Lord. And does the Lord know what else you've got in your drawer, Sydney? Uh, it's quite innocent. Yes, but you're not, are you, eh? What's all this? Eh? I think we should discuss this somewhere else. No, I haven't done anything. Well, you're not going to start blaming me all over again. I think you've been a very naughty boy again. No, I haven't done anything bad. I learned my lesson. My mother just died. Children are my friends. All right, come and sit down opposite me, Sydney. Come on, sit there. I want you to promise me that you'll never be a bad boy again. Go on, I want you to swear it on the Bible. I swear on the Bible, I will never be a bad boy again. And I'll return to Newcastle first thing tomorrow. Sir? It's all right. And? And? You'll never come back to Denton again. I'll never, ever come back to Denton again. Amen. Amen. He practically confessed the evidence was lying there. We should have taken him in. Oh, come on, Sergeant. You've seen him. He's inadequate. He's pathetic. Look at him. He's a 40-year-old virgin. His mother's just died. I mean, look around you. His world has collapsed. Now, I nicked him once before, and he was sent to prison and used as a punch bag. Now, that shouldn't happen again. Right. I'm putting it on record. I completely disagree with what you just did. You have let loose a child abuser who's incapable of controlling himself and will probably offend again. My case was almost complete. All that goes in my report. All right, we'll get in touch with Newcastle CID. That way, we'll keep tabs on him. It is not enough. That man is a child abuser and you heard him admit it.
Right, fellas. Thanks again. Police. Hmm? Oh. oh, I'll get it. I'll get it. <clears throat> oh. Alpha Bravo 24 to control. I come in. Nasty one, Jack. Two kids dead and a mother gone missing. Tillin's in there, sir, and Sergeant Wood. All right. Okay, yeah. will you? Make yourself useful. Chat to the neighbours. It'll save you a job in the morning. Oh, that's good. Well, oh, it's a tragic mess, Jack. Two kids dead, and the mother's done a runner. Oh, my God. Yeah. What was her name? Nancy Grover, age 21. Nobody saw her leave, but we think she's wearing a red coat. We are looking for her now. Mm -hmm. Where's her father? He's in there. The medic's given him a sedative, said he needs to go to hospital. Yeah. The fellow's in deep shock. All right, I'll have a word with him. Well, he can try, Jack, but with what he's been given, he'll soon be out cold. Dr. McKenzie's on his way. All right, in that case, I'd better take a look at the kids then, and I? Okay. Dennis, age three. Linda. Aged 11 months. And we think that that's the pillow used to smother them. Dear, oh dear, oh dear. Mm. Yeah, all right, all right. No clues as to where the mother might be, I suppose. No, not really, Jack, no. Has he had a cup of tea? Yeah. Good. She did it. Hmm? She got my kids. Who was that, Mr. Grover? Your wife? 
<laughs> sir, sir. Yes. He's heavily sedated, sir. Said he got home around two to find his wife gone and the kids dead. Yes, sir. Yeah. All right, stay with him, will you? There's someone outside who might be able to help. Who's that? The workmaid who drove him home. The old bloke across the road saw his van stop outside, so we gave him a call. Uh, what's going on? Who are you? Phil Collard. What marks, mate? I drove him out tonight. Well, rather two this morning. They were worked together, carpet finished. I see. Well... Mark? Phil. My babies. They're dead, Phil. <laughs> Mr. Collard. I'd like to talk to you for a minute. Inside. Please. Thank you. Who was that, Sergeant? It's a father, Dr. McKenzie. In deep shock. The uh, babies are in a small bedroom. Could you, um, did you check for any injections? Injections? I understood it was a possible asphyxiation. Yeah, but if you find any pinpricks, you know, from a hypodermic. I look out for anything unusual. Right, you said that you were working tonight. It's a funny time to be fitting carpet, isn't it? Well, we've got a rush job. A nice little pair. We were down the pub this evening, as per usual, when uh, Mark got a call on his mobile. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Maltby from Bonner's department store. Well, hold on just a second. Oh, who was that again? Uh, uh, Mr. Maltby from Bonner's department store. Okay. Uh, could we do a rush job for them? Well, 200 apiece. <laughs> we jumped at it. I, I came with the van around uh, eight to pick him up. Uh, Nancy had the hump. Sat there complaining and sulking, kids screaming and shouting. And why did she have the hump? The usual thing. Huh? She didn't like being left on her own. Oh. We uh, got to Bonley's about 8.30, fitted the grippers and underlay, but well, the carpet turned up about then. So we well, worked like the clappers and got done around quarter to two. I, I drove Mark back here, I dropped him at the door, then I went home to bed. So, had she ever threatened anything like this before? Well, she often said she'd do herself in. Any idea where she might have gone? I mean, to relatives or friends? Nah, she didn't make friends. Relatives? I've not heard of any. Now, Mr. Collar, just for the record, is there anyone at Bonley's that can confirm that you were there tonight? Not security guard. I mean, I mean what, what are you suggesting then? No, 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 no. No, it's just that we've got to check everyone out, you know, the innocent, you know, the guilty. Um, OK, that'll be fine. If you'd like to just wait here for a minute, will you? Collier. Um, go in there now, will you please, and uh, check out Mr. Collard's story about Bonley's department store this evening. Mr. Collard. Got anything, Sergeant? We've got a neighbour here, sir, who saw something. Oh, ah. Well, sir, can you tell me what you saw? I don't sleep, you see. Mm -hmm. That was when you get older. I heard someone running down the street round about 1.30. That's what woke me up. Yeah. I couldn't get back to sleep, so I took the dog out. Uh, Mark and his mate got home round about 2. Oh, right. Thank you very much. Very helpful. Thank Please you. Look after you, will you, Sergeant? Right, Jack. Not now, Sandy, please. This is bad. You owe me, right? We're looking for the kid's mother, OK? She killed him. Like something suddenly snapped. Oh, come on, Sam. But you're not sure. Now, don't say you're baffled. I'm not baffled, and I'm never sure. This is going to be a big story, Jack. Yeah, well, you know us at Denton. We never seek publicity. See you, Jack. Mr. Mullet! Mr. Mullet, sir! Could we have a statement, please? All I can say at the present time is that we have an excellent team. 
My people will be doing everything in their power. Morning, Bill. Morning, Jack. He wants to see you. Hmm? Do you mean mullet? I always mean mullet. Morning, sir. <clears throat> Saw you had your photograph taken last night. Sit down. No, it's all right. It's you all right. heard I said sit down. Now, first you better tell me who you think is responsible for the death of those kids. Well, at this stage, we think it's the mother. Did you know the little boy had been given an injection in his upper arm? What? I'm told it happened after death. Do you see what that means? So? What that means is that whoever did it almost certainly murdered him and the other child. Now, I've been given a report by D.S. Maud, which I propose to take very seriously. Sidney Snell. Yes, Sidney Snell, the habitual child molester. She was going to arrest him, you let him loose to return to Newcastle. Look, I don't think that Sidney Snell had anything to do with this. No? Look at the links. Snell breaks into people's houses and injects young children out of some misguided idea of helping them. The Grover house was broken into and the little boy injected. Sydney is pathological, he's inadequate, but he is not a killer. How do you know that? Supposing something went wrong. Supposing one of the children woke and made a noise and he had to put a pillow over their face. Supposing the mother came in here to murder her too. All right, where's the body? I don't know, but the point is you're an experienced policeman and you let Snell go and I want to know why. Because I felt bloody sorry for him. I'd nicked him once before. He didn't think he'd done anything wrong. They promised him psychiatric help. Instead, they sent him to jail where he was beaten up. Then he should have learned his lesson, shouldn't he? And so should you. But instead of detaining him, you sent him packing. Now, what have you got to say for yourself? Not a lot. You made a stupid, unprofessional decision. You know what could happen now, don't you? If a man you failed to arrest proves to have murdered two children, that amounts to neglect of duty. Chief Constable will set up an inquiry. And this time I've no intention of protecting you. I wouldn't expect you to, sir. I ought to suspend you straight away, but you know this Snell character, that's going to be useful. So I'm bringing in DCI Peters to run this case. From now on, you will take your instructions directly from him. Sir. I'm sorry, sir. I had to do it to safeguard my position. The evidence was clear. I understand, Sergeant. So long as you don't think it's personal. No, I didn't. I thought it was a very good career move. Yeah, well. Yes, well. Now we've got Inspector Peters over both of us, and he's a very tidy man, and he'll want a very tidy solution. Yes, well. Has anything come up? Not much. Two neighbours who thought they heard rowing from the bungalow sometime earlier on. What, the Grovers? No, it couldn't have been, sir. I checked out Mark Grover at Bonnelly's department store. According to the night security guard, the two carpet fitters were there from half past eight till almost two this morning. They had no way of getting out because the main security door was locked. Can anyone confirm that? Yeah, I spoke to the man who hired him, Mr Maltby from Bonley's store. He said he rang about midnight to check progress and spoke to Mark Grover while he was there. Yes, well, all right, Sergeant. Come on, then. What else are in Mr Peter's plans? Full-scale search for the mother, and we're looking for Sydney Snell. Right. I'm just on my way to the mortuary to speak to the pathologist. All right. I think I'll come with you. Straightforward. The children were asphyxiated with a pillow while they were sleeping. They wouldn't have cried out, wouldn't have known anything. The injection mark on the boy's arm. What do you make of that? Nothing I can make sense of. 
It occurred to me that he might have been sedated. There's no sign of that. Could it have been water? Well, it could. You'll, uh, you'll want time of death. For the moment, somewhere between 11 p.m. and midnight. I could be more precise if you could find out what time the children had their last meal. The father must know when they were fed. He's still in hospital on sedation. He's in deep shock. Doctor won't let us question him. And you haven't found the mother? No. If I may say so, I do think you should try and be quick about it. Why say that? Because quite often the mother kills herself soon afterwards. That's if she's the killer of the children. We don't know that. We do have another suspect. Morning. All right, Bill? Oh, uh, Jack. Huh? DCIP has set up a team briefing on the Grover case. He wants you both there in 15 minutes. Oh, yeah. Uh, and Jack, mm -hmm. um... You got them back, Mr. Frost. Well done. I, I, I knew you would. Oh, Mrs. Hinckley, yeah. All right, sorry, sorry. Yes. Your medals. Ah. That's it. Thank there you, you go, Jack. Mm. Now then. Do you see anything that's yours? Of course I do. It's his DFM. I never thought I'd see it again. Can I take it now? I'm afraid not, Mrs. Sinkley. Uh, oh. It's evidence, you see. We've got to hang on to it for a bit. Oh, and the photos. Oh, what a relief. I'd hate to think of these falling into the wrong hands. Please you, Mrs. Sinclair. My husband did all his own developing. Oh, you were pretty well developed yourself by the looks of things. Yeah. Jack, the briefing's starting. Hmm? Jack? <clears throat> oh, yes. Um, you better take those home, Mrs. Sinclair. If you leave them here, we'll all get too excited. I wasn't always old, you see. Nancy Grover, 21, the missing mother. Address, 25 Creswell Street. Nancy has a history of depression. She's been under treatment. Social services were involved, and on several occasions, she's threatened to take her own life. We think she's wearing the red coat. We've started without you, Inspector. Yes, I see. Um, <clears throat> sorry. We also want to find this man, Sidney Snell. Consider him a suspect as well as the mother. We need to find them both. Right, any questions? Okay, get to it. <clears throat> okay. Police officers are arguing now. We should be on the move soon. Where is she? Just inside the tunnel there. See? Uh, any idea how long it'll take? No, I'm afraid not. It's played hell with the timetable. We've got trains backed up all the way down the line. Really? It's tough. Mr. Grover? Remember me? How are you today? Not too well, are we? She killed my babies. Mm. 
Mr. Grover, there is something I have to tell you. We've found Nancy, and I'm afraid she's dead. She killed herself. She said she would. <laughs> she killed my baby! <laughs> Mark, Mark. <laughs> I think you better go. Grover, last night you said someone entered your house. Now, did you see anyone inside? Leave me alone. Please, yeah. just go. Yeah, please. Please. Any idea who she is? Uh, it's just someone that uh, we've been looking for. That train hit her? No, no, no. The trap worker saw on the line ahead and stopped the train. The time was the last free train, wasn't it? Well, there was the 12.05, then the 12.40, then that's it till this morning. Can you examine your trains? They're all over the place, sir, but we'll try. Now, can you move her and let us get back to a normal service? Could she have been walking through the tunnel? I'd say it was more likely she jumped from the parapet, landed on the roof of a train and got carried in. Thank you. What? That's it, then. What? She killed her kids, walked up there and jumped. Hmm? Hey, just a minute. Now, we've got witnesses stating that they heard a row around midnight. She must have been pretty like a bloody foot to get here to be hit by the 12.05 or the 12.40, come to that. Quite so, Inspector. What's more, this death isn't a suicide. She was murdered. Come again? If she'd gone under the wheels, we might not have seen it until the full post-mortem. But there are stab wounds to her arms. I presume where she tried to defend herself. Then again, she'd been stabbed in the chest. Sharp knife, pointed. It's possible that she was murdered elsewhere, probably around midnight, then brought here. Her other injuries come from the train. So if it's murder? That brings us back to Sidney Snell again, doesn't it? Sidney Snell is not a frenzied killer. If he'd done it, he wouldn't try to hide the crime by bringing the body here. He'd just panic and run away. Look, why don't we go back to Cresswell Street and review the evidence? I mean, if he'd done it, why isn't the house full of blood stains? I don't know. Snell was diagnosed psychotic. Nancy Grover was supposed to be suicidal. Look, Jack, we both know why you don't want it to be Snell. I presume before they put all this bloody polythene stuff down, all the carpets were checked for blood stains. Yes, of course, sir. They're clean. Right. So that means that if anyone was stabbed to death in any of these rooms, you would have found evidence? Yes, sir. There you are, Jim. Remember those old questions they taught us? Whereabouts and what with? Could have happened outside or somewhere else. Yeah, but where's the evidence, eh? The evidence. You know the courts are in love with that sort of stuff. We'll find it. Speaking of evidence, we found something quite interesting in the kitchen. It's, uh, it's the back door, sir. Now, the, uh, apparently the neighbour's kids broke the panel. And I'd say that this plywood here has been nailed on fairly recently. But as you can see, it's been forced. Now, probably the intruder shoved his hand through and turned the key. It could have been one of the family. Oh, Jack! Well... It shouldn't be too hard to find out. You see, whoever did it grazed his arm. We have blood stains, And we're getting DNA, which can be matched to a suspect. If you should happen to have one. We have. Sidney Snell. I'm bringing him in. Now that's three you owe me. No, oh, never mind. It's expenses. Yeah. Now I want to check a rumor with you, Jack. Nancy Grover did not jump in front of that train. She was pushed. You know better than to listen to rumours, Sandy. Wouldn't be a news hound if I didn't. Is it true? This isn't a mothering crisis after all. It's a threefold murder. 
and the police have a prime suspect. Oh, do they? Do they really, Sandy? Go on. There's hmm. another rumour going about. About you. I told you not to listen to rumours. This one says you cocked it up. You had the prime suspect and you let him go again. Who told you that? Is it true? Jack, this time I'm not asking you because I want to print it. But someone will. It could do you a lot of damage, you better understand that. I'm not leaning on you. I'm, I'm, I'm talking as a friend. I'm a good policeman, Sandy. Not one of the new kind, I'm the old-fashioned kind. With feelings and gut instincts. All right, so I don't play by the rule book and I cut corners. But my judgement is good. We know that, but is it this time? Truth is, Sandy, yesterday I made a stupid decision. Because I felt sorry for someone at the time. Well, I made it and I've got to live with it. None of us go on forever. Maybe I'm losing it. My job's changing too, Jack. Getting dirtier all the time. Everybody's fair game these days. Doesn't matter what you did once or if you were the local hero. It's what you do now that counts. Meaning what? Meaning you better get your finger out because your reputation isn't going to protect you. Call me if you need me. I've got to go. to see me tonight. Oh, yes, well, no, it is. You had enough of me, then? No, of course not, Kitty. You've been very good to me. Of course I have. What is it, then? Well, I suppose you'll read about it in the papers tomorrow. I was the one that let the man go who they think murdered those kids. Well, you must have had your reasons. Oh, yeah, I did. They were bad reasons. I arrested this bloke about seven years ago. Still have nightmares about it. The neighbours screaming hatred, banging on the roof of the car. I felt sorry for him, and it clouded my judgment. I know he didn't kill those kids, but I should never have let him go. Look, Jack, you're right. You always were. It's just you're exhausted. What you need's a holiday. What would I do with a holiday? If you're determined to sit there and be sorry for yourself, I'm off. Yeah, well, all right, get to you. I think I just better get this sorted, you know. Well, you see you do, then. Because I don't hang around forever. Just you remember that. Any sign of Snell, Sergeant? No, sir. He seems to have vanished. Well, he couldn't be going back to his old home. They're pulling those houses down, do they?
Come on, Sydney. Sydney. You might say he was at home. You know I didn't do it. Do I? Do I? How did you cut your hand? On the Bible? Now listen, you promised Jack, me. You stay away from this. He's my prisoner. Don't you want me in on the interview? No, I don't. Sit down, please. Interview with Mr. Snell, 11.05 a.m. Those present, DCI Peters. Yes, Maud. I'm detaining you in connection with the deaths of Nancy, Dennis, and Linda Grover. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defense if you do not mention when questioned something which you later rely on in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. Do you understand? Yes, I do, Mr. Peters. Now, Mr. Snell, your left hand is bandaged. Can you tell us how you incurred that injury? Was it when you entered the Grover house the night of the murder? Uh, I don't know. You've given a blood sample. It matches blood stains found on the back door. There were plywood fibers in the wound. You illegally entered the Grover house two nights ago, didn't you? I didn't want to hurt anyone. I love children. I, I could never harm them. I only want to make them better. Only sometimes things go wrong, don't they? Sydney, you've always tried to be a good boy, haven't you? Take a look at that. Yes, what is it? Snell's confession. Confession? Confession to what? Burglary. Child abuse, the murder of Mrs. Grover and her two children. It all happened in a haze, he says. He doesn't know what came over him. Oh, bloody hell. Don't you mean congratulations? No, I mean bloody hell. I think I made a very foolish decision. He promised me on the Bible. It wasn't just foolish, was it, Jack? It was fatal. Two children who would be alive are now dead because of your action. The Chief Constable has already asked for my report. I shall have to recommend an inquiry. In the circumstances, I ought to suspend you straight away, but, um, well, if you can settle this Hoxton case quickly, that'll be something to say in your favour. Listen. Stay away from Snell. He's in custody where he belongs. He'll be sent for trial. Yes. Jack. I truly regret this. So do I. Yes. You remember someone tried to use Lemmy Hobson's credit card at the Supertech discount warehouse? Yes. Well, we got an ident from one of the assistants. It looks like it was his old friend, Dougie Cooper. Oh, was he? Well, go and talk to him then, will you? The DCI peelers won't like this. Well, we'd better not tell him then, eh? Oh, Mr. Frost. Shut up, Sydney, and sit down. I want to finish reading this. What is it? Your confession. All done of your own free will. They said I'd go down for a, a very long time. So it would be best if I was a, a good boy and cooperated with the, the police. Yes, but good boys don't cooperate with the police by telling them porkies, do they? Look at this. You say here you broke in about 1.30 and committed murder. But I know that Mrs. Grover's body was on the railway about an hour earlier. 
Maybe I, I got the, the time wrong. Oh, maybe you got the time wrong. All right, then. Come on. Where did you kill her? Was it the children's bedroom? Yes. Yes. Well, you must have been bloody clever because you stabbed her 11 times and didn't leave a single blood stain. All right, then. What did you kill her with? Huh? They found a knife in my medical bag. Sydney, you... you promised me you'd be a good boy. You swore to me that you'd never interfere with children again, but you were in that house. Your blood is on the door. You didn't keep your promise, did you? No, Mr Frost. I didn't kill them. I couldn't. Why did you sign this? Mr. Peter said it would give me peace of mind. Oh, yeah. About 25 years of it, with a bit of remission for good behaviour. Come on, what happened, Sydney? Sometimes God talks to me, Mr. Frost. Oh, yeah? What does he say? Go out and kill a couple of kids and their mother just to spite that silly old sod Frost who should have had you banged up in the first place. He told me to look after children while they were sleeping. Maybe I could help. But you can't, can you? You don't help, you just inject them so you can get a thrill. Don't hurt them. I saw that lady in the park with her children. I followed them home. After you came that day, I packed. Then I remembered those children. And I went to the house. We broke in and went to the kids' bedroom. You can hear kids when they're sleeping. <laughs> so quiet. I should have known something was wrong. The boy. He had his arm on the cover. I pricked him. Just a little injection. They usually stir or moan. He didn't. When I touched his face, he didn't move. I couldn't hear him breathing. Neither of them was breathing. were dead. I was in the room with two dead children. Did the mother come in? I didn't see the mother. I didn't think anyone else was in the house. I, I just panicked and I, I ran out into the street and then I, I stayed out all night. I'm innocent, Mr Frost. You're not, are you? You're a pervert who interferes with children. What would your mum say now? I was a bad boy. A very bad boy. Why should I believe you now? I don't know. Neither do I. You're very quiet. What's your problem? I was just wondering why we're chasing after a petty criminal like Dougie Cooper when we should be arresting Mark Grover. Grover? Yes, I know. Yes, it might be Mark Grover. But just look at the evidence. Sidney Snell did break into the Grover's house and he did inject those children. Hmm. Lovely country. Yes, ideal. Especially if you didn't like Lemmy and you wanted to lose him. I suppose he had a bust up Dougie and Lemmy, and Lemmy killed him. Well, in that case, why would Dougie bother to move the body up to the old cottage? Why wouldn't he just well, bury it around here somewhere? Mm. Who did you say lives here? The Miss Flemings, two sisters. Never reported a burglary, though, we checked. Mm -hmm. 
That's it. The old schoolhouse. Miss Fleming? I'm Caroline Fleming. Police? Sorry to disturb you. We're doing a check-up on doorstep con artists. Oh, yes. And what are those? Well, they're people who come to the door saying they're on official business. Like you, you mean? We really are police, Miss Fleming. Do phone Denton Police Station and check if you wish. We'll wait here. You look reliable. You better come in. We wondered if you'd ever had a visitor claiming to be from the water board. About a year ago, when we moved in, he turned the water on for us. You mean he really was from the water board? But that's what you said, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, we met about three months ago, Miss Fleming. Uh, this was the man. He claims to be from the water board, and while he's in the house, he slips upstairs and robs the bedrooms. Dreadful. Yes. I've never seen him. He certainly hasn't been to the house. What makes you think he might have? Well, it's just that he was on his way here the day he died. Died? Mm, well, he was murdered. How awful. Could your sister have seen him? She may have done when I was out. She's at work at the moment. Oh, Julie, you're back. We've met. You're the nurse at the hospital. Yes, and Caroline's sister. They're police. They want to know about a man they thought had come to the door. Uh, yes. Um... This is the man, Miss Fleming. I've never seen him before. About three months ago, Miss Fleming, just after lunchtime. Could you have been here? Let's see. Um... No, I was on night duties all that month, and... So if he came, there'd have been no reply, and he'd have left again. I'm sorry, I'm afraid we're really not much help. We're very quiet here. We don't expect visitors, except a few friends from the village. How's Mr. Grover? Oh, didn't you know he was discharged last night? Oh, was he? Do you know where he went? Staying with friends. Uh, Mr. Collard came to collect him. Oh, right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Miss Fleming. And, um, uh, Miss Fleming. <laughs> Sorry to have disturbed you. What, that Miss Julie can give me a blanket bath any day of the week. Well, I don't think she'd be interested, sir. Eh? Why not? I think she'd be rather more interested in me. What now? Hmm? Oh, uh, Mark Grover's been discharged. Now, I want to have a word with that security guy. What's his name? Dan Milton. That's all. What makes you think that she'd be more interested in giving you a blanket bath than me? Dan! Could you come down? Why? I've only just come up. Remember me, Mr. Melton? You lot again. So, when am I supposed to get some sleep? Yeah, well, I'm sorry, won't keep you a minute. It's just that I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about what happened at Bonnelly's store the other night. Better take him in the lounge, then. It'll be quieter. No, it'll be warmer in the kitchen. I was wanting to feed her in there. Well, she can starve another minute, can't she? Three. Oh, cute. Kids drive you crazy, don't they? Yes. Want a cuppa? Oh, very nice. Yes, thank you. Now then, just a couple of points you can clear up for me, Mr. Milton. You said Mr. Grover arrived at Bonley's about eight and didn't leave till half past one in the morning. Correct. Right. And he couldn't have left without your knowledge? No. The entrances are all electronically controlled. I'd have had to work a switch to let him out. I see. So, anyway, they were on the top floor, so where were you? In the security cubicle, by the entrance, watching the security cameras. Oh, right. Watching the security cameras, eh? Hmm. Or else I was doing my rounds. I have to check every floor at half-hour intervals and click a key in the security locks. They couldn't get out of the place while you were doing that? No, not without a master key. And I had that. All right, all right. That's it, Mr. Milton. Yeah, fine, thank you. Listen, don't worry about the tea. Thanks very much. All right, come on, Sergeant. Um, is this the way out? No, not that way, that's... Well, 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 well. I spy with my little eye something beginning with knit. Isn't this the same carpet they were putting down at Bonnelly's, Sergeant? It certainly looks like it, sir. 
It was a remnant. It would only have gone to waste. Then you better sit down and tell me all about it, Mr. Melton. Oh, Dan! Somebody must have taken the wrong measurements. There was a big chunk left over. You thought that you'd take it. Well, 50-50. 50-50? Well, how did it get here? Who put it down? They did. They did. So Grover and Collard did leave the building that night. Not for long, though. A couple of hours. You've been telling us porkies, Mr. Melton. If Bonley's new, I'd be for the high jump. For the high jump? I'm investigating a murder here, and you've made false statements to the police. Now, I want to know what happened. Those two came in the store about eight and worked like the clappers. I went up around 11. They were almost done. They had the piece left over. We made a deal. They'd do my lounge and hang on to the rest. So you did let them out the store? What time was that? About 11. They came back up by around 1 to finish off. They tied it up and left just before 2. All right, come on, Sergeant. What are we doing here, sir? Well, Another one of your hunches. You just keep your eyes open and follow me. What am I looking for? You're looking for a nice new piece of carpet that came out of Bonnelly's department store. Now, it wasn't at Grover's, so where is it? Are you sure this is safe, sir? Yeah, of course it is. Do that to me again. What have you got? I've got a nice new piece of carpet. There. It's wasted on the floor in there, wasn't it? Right, nip back to the car and get hold of Collier. Tell him to come and collect it. I want this examined by forensic. Every mark and every single stain. What made you think it would be in there? My nose. My nose, I worked it out. They had to carry the body in something, didn't they? So when they dropped her onto the roof of the train, they threw the carpet on afterwards, hoping it would be carried miles away from here. But fortunately for us, it dropped off in the tunnel. I suppose we'd better go and have a talk with Mark Grover. Give your press, would you kindly piss off? No, we're from the police, Mr. Collard. Do you remember? I want to speak to Mr. Grover. Can't you leave the poor sod alone? He's completely shattered. He was crazy about those kids. We've got one or two things down at the station that need to be identified if we're going to convict the killer, and I'm sure that he would want that. I'm sorry, I can't help you. He's gone for a walk. Grover. I never want to come here again. Stand there. You know what this is, Mark? 
No. Oh, I think you do. This is your part of the carpet that was acquired from Bonnelly's department store. Do you see those marks? They're blood stains. They're the same group as your dead wife, Nancy. <laughs> I've got to go. All right, stop it! Mr. Grover, you have been cautioned and you've heard your rights. Now you know you don't have to say anything. No. No. But for the sake of conversation, I'll tell you how I think it is, shall I? On the night in question, you had a row with your wife. She was very depressed. You got fed up with her and the kids. Not the kids. Oh, yes. So you lost your temper, you picked up your carpet knife and you stabbed her with it. The kids were screaming, so you've got to shut them up too. No! I'd never hurt my kids! Now you've got blood all over your nice new carpet, so you've got to get rid of it. So you chucked it on the top of a train at the railway tunnel, where you dumped Nancy's body onto the tracks to make it look like suicide! No, it wasn't like that! Wasn't it? What was it like then? Come on, you tell me. Hmm? We've been rowing. That's what our life was. It was one endless row. But she couldn't cope. The kids got her down. She didn't have any friends. I was never there. I said I was never there because she wanted money to go out and spend, and nobody earns that sitting around at home all day. No. Very true, Mr. Grover. Well, that night, we got the rush job at Bonley's. And it all started again. And then she said, if you go out and leave me alone again, I'll kill myself. Did you know she was pregnant? Yeah, she told me. She said she wanted an abortion. And you didn't want that, did you? I said she couldn't kill a child of mine. You and Phil were laying the carpet in the lounge. Phil went to make tea. And then Nancy come in. <laughs> she was laughing at me. She's laughing at you, was she? And then she said, there's no need to worry about the kids anymore, Mark. There won't be a trouble now. And then I went into their bedroom. <laughs> and there they were. She smothered them with a pillow. So I went back into the lounge and she was laughing at me. And I had the carpet knife in my hand. And I... The wife killed the children, so he killed the wife. Yes, that's it, sir. And you got a confession? Well, I'm hoping to get two. 
It was Collard, the workmate, who figured out how to conceal the crime. He wrapped the body in the carpet and then they dumped the body onto the rail track to make it look like suicide. And it was Collard who found Grover some clean clothes and burnt the others. Why would he put himself at risk like that? Oh, I don't know. They were at school together. They were best mates. Tragic case. Mm. Do you know, uh, I can't help feeling sorry for him. I know just how you feel, sir. By the way, Jack, I think I owe you something. Oh. What's that, sir? An apology? No. A holiday. Oh. Oh, sir. Yes? Have you got a minute? Yes, I've got several, Sergeant. What is it? Well, there's been something worrying me about this Hoxton case. Mm -hmm. So I thought it'd be worth checking up on past tenants who used to live at the old farm cottages. Take a look at that. Yeah, well. One of those sisters, Miss J. Fleming. Sorry to bother you again, Miss Fleming. It's just that we've got one or two loose ends that we need to tie up. You didn't tell us he used to live at Woodside Farm Cottages. No, I didn't. Why should I? Well, do you remember the man who never called? Well, that's where we found his body. It was in a coal bunker next door to the cottage where you used to live. I don't see how we were supposed to know that. Look, I'm sorry. I can't help you. We'd still like to come in, anyway. We have a witness that said Mr. Hoxton was on his way to this cottage the day that he died. Now, we haven't been able to trace Mr. Hoxton to anywhere else, so with your permission, I'd like to have a little look round. Inspector, we told you that man never came here. Are you all right, Miss Fleming? You're shaking. Can I get you something? Yes. Another brandy. the drawer he took the jewellery from. Don't be ridiculous. It's all there, isn't it? Oh, what's this? Are these your passports? Put them back! Put all them right. back! OK, calm down, will you? That's enough, Julie! I apologise for my sister. You're not sisters, are you? No. It's passports. A Miss J. Fleming and a Miss C.R. Adams. We live together, but it suits us to say we're sisters rather than lovers. They're good people in this village, but they're not overly liberal. We came here for a quiet life, so we play things on their terms. Did Lemmy Hoxton threaten to blackmail you? He just came here, robbed us and left. Well, he robbed you and you did nothing about it? We didn't want anyone to know what was taken. You told me nothing was taken. But it's all here. All this jewellery. Lemmy would have never gone from here, leaving all this stuff. He didn't leave here, did he? Never walked back down that lane. Caroline's very upset. She doesn't know what she's saying. We're going to have to explain. It was my fault. I never should have let him in. When I was tidying up in the kitchen, he slipped upstairs. Julie was sleeping in the small bedroom because it was cooler.
she heard him go into the bathroom. And then into the bedroom. She went in. And there he was, looking in the drawer. He'd found our personal possessions, photographs, passports. I was in my nightdress. I told him to put everything back. There was some magazines, too. He had this dirty grin on his face. He said, I know your sort. What you need is the real thing. me onto the bed. He was going to rape me. I scream. I could hear Julie screaming. I ran upstairs and into the bedroom. And Julie was lying on the bed. and smashed it down on his head. I killed him. Caroline suddenly appeared. I was uh, still struggling. She was trying to pull him off me. She pulled at his shirt and uh, he rolled off me for a moment and that's when I grabbed the lamp and I hit him with it. He, um, didn't yell. He just groaned. should have told the police. Your friend was being attacked. He tried to rape her. She was in fear of her life. It was mutual self-defense. This may be hard for you to understand, Inspector. But two years ago, I fell in love for the first time ever with Julie. When I moved in with her, I left behind a husband and two children. I changed my name. I changed my life. I knew that if we reported this attack, all of that would have to come out. So the longer the body lay undiscovered, the more you put it into the back of your mind. There isn't a day goes by when I don't feel guilty about what happened. <laughs> Julie took charge of disposing the body. After I'd killed him, I was like a zombie. I just did what she said. 
What will happen to us now, Inspector? Well, you'll be charged. So get yourself a good solicitor. He should be able to arrange bail. And if he's half decent, you'll end up with a suspended sentence. Guess what? Julie confessed. So did Caroline. <laughs> Each protecting the other. So, what do we do now? We let them talk to their solicitor, then we re-interview them and... and they'll both volunteer the truth. Sergeant, yeah. tell the duty solicitor he can see his clients now, will you? By the way, sir, I thought you want to know. I've asked to go back to Fernley Division. Better career prospects. So nothing came of that promotion, then? Mr Mullet says he's tried all he can. No, I'm sure he did in his own way. Oh, I'm sorry, Sergeant. What have you to say, sir? No, no, I mean it. You're all right. Is it something I did? Yes, the railway tunnel. Oh. No, it wasn't anything you did. Well, I know that I'm a rotten bastard to work for. Well, that's not quite what I was going to say. But I do really regret putting in that report about you. <laughs> I mean, I still think you're way out of line over Snell, but if you hadn't have gone with your instincts, the wrong man would have gone to jail for murder. Truth is, Liz, it's nose. Now, you're a good policeman. This woman, sir. All right, you're a good policewoman. Thank you. But it's important. To remember your nose. Yes, sir. I always remember your nose. Right. So, what are you reading? I said you needed a holiday. Uh, holiday. Yeah, that's where you get all the sunshine and some other poor bugger gets all the rain. Hardly seems fair, does it? Mind you, I've heard that Benidorm's quite nice. Benidorm? Thank you.